2021, the year of the business acquisition. In this episode, I break down the hot button issues SBA lenders need to know to succeed in the space. Business acquisitions have been exploding these last few years, and that trend isn't slowing down anytime soon. So more and more SBA lenders are trying to get into the space, and we can use more SBA lenders in the space. The problem is that most of them aren't willing to do what it takes to be a serious player. Before a bank decides that they want to get more active in the business acquisition world, they've really got to have a frank discussion internally about what that means. We're lending on goodwill. You know, there isn't going to be much hard collateral, and that's quite different than most of the other lending that takes place inside the bank. And these deals aren't small either. We're talking up to $5 million of blue sky lending. And the vast majority of banks are not okay with that. They may be okay with some level of unsecured exposure, and that's usually anywhere from half a million to 1.5 million typically. And that's so that they don't have a massive loss on any one single deal. And when I joined Fundex last December, it opened my eyes to this whole new world because we don't have any of those artificial caps on goodwill. And as a result, we're a prominent business acquisition lender and I'm helping some really sophisticated borrowers. I mean, we're talking about skilled operators with super impressive backgrounds. These are folks that I would have never had the opportunity to help because they're seeking larger deals, and perhaps they don't have a ton of real estate equity to bring down the unsecured exposure. So the unsecured exposure is pretty big. But I'd argue that a lot of these deals are actually stronger in all other aspects. So in this episode, I'm going to sort of walk through the process and the structuring of a business acquisition, starting as early as pre-qualifying a potential buyer. Some folks want to get pre-qualified before they've actually found a business. And that's possible. I basically look for three things to see if they have enough cash for a down payment, as well as some post-closing liquidity. I make sure they have decent personal credit. And I try to determine if their background and professional experience is well suited for someone to own and operate a business. And I can kind of help guide them and let them know, you know, maybe they should be looking in this range and kind of steer them towards purchasing a business that would actually accentuate their particular set of skills and past experiences. Uh, Cause ultimately they aren't going to have direct industry experience in a lot of these cases, you know, unless it's a really technical business where you absolutely need the direct industry experience, but they are going to need some sort of transferable experience and management experience, experience, managing a budget, experiencing, managing a PNL experience, managing people, that sort of thing. Just like I pre-qualify buyers, I also pre-qualify the business. So if a business is being listed for sale, I'll grab their last three years business tax returns, then their interim financials, and basically just trying to determine if the cash flow from the business can support the repayment of the loan. And ideally, I'm looking for two consecutive years of debt service coverage. And the larger the transaction, the more debt service coverage I'm typically looking for. So the big hot button here is usually around addbacks. These are seller's personal expenses that they're typically running through the business, which aren't going to be carrying over to a new buyer, as well as the non-recurring expenses or one-time expenses. And the reason this is such a hot button issue is because sellers tend to throw every single little thing up against the wall to see what sticks. And you kind of have to go through it and figure out what's actually a valid addback and something we can hang our hat on and document most importantly. Sometimes I just see some crazy ones like, you know, unreported revenue, you can't really count. You know, sometimes they'll have a sales rep that didn't do a great job and they'll try to add back, you know, their whole salary. And the reason I can't count a sales rep that you fired is because, you know, you're taking out the expense, but not taking into account any of the revenue that they may have touched. So some of those are a little bit more gray. I tend to focus on the more obvious ones. Like if they're paying an employee who's not really active in the business, their personal car, personal health insurance, that sort of thing. I just had one deal, and this happens all the time, where they gave us figures of these ad backs, and they were all basically legal expenses for a lawsuit, which is typically you know non-recurring. 
and they provided a letter that outlined the legal expenses. And so I asked for documentation to verify the numbers and they sent them, but it was lower than what they were telling us. So they had to revise the letter and ultimately that's less seller's discretionary earnings that you have to work with. And that's why it's important to get the documentation and not simply take the seller's word for it. By the way, another thing that keeps coming up is PPP income reflected in the 2020 financials. It's also gonna probably be in some of the 2021 financials. The forgiveness of the PPP loan is actually considered income under the new tax code. So the accountants are putting it in the P&Ls and the tax returns as other income or miscellaneous income. And you need to carve that out. Just like you would carve out a non-recurring expense and add that back, you're gonna do the opposite for non-recurring income and take that out. So now you've pre-approved a buyer and they wanna buy a business that you've also pre-approved for an SBA loan. This is where the rubber meets the road. Pre-approving an actual transaction is a lot different because now you need to be able to tell someone whether or not you think you can actually get this done and under what structure. And until you have a buyer and a seller, you don't really know the answer to that question because you've gotta look at the buyer and figure out are they well suited to run this business? And what kind of personal draw will they need? And you need to look at their cash and the deal structure and assess the overall transaction. Now, if you do think you can get it done and you've got to determine the structure and the SBA allows up to 90% financing for these business acquisitions. However, each lender has their own guidelines for structuring these types of deals. For example, we can finance the full 90% on loans up to $2 million, but after 2 million, will only go up to 85% financing. And some lenders are much more conservative than that. And in many cases, they require seller financing. Now, seller financing is a good idea and buyers should ask sellers to hold paper. You know, it's a great way to keep their feet to the fire, especially during the transitionary period. But some sellers are unwilling and probably at least half of the sellers are gonna just say, no, I don't wanna mess with it. And I wanna just get all my cash out now, which I find unrealistic. You know, especially when you're trying to sell your business in the middle of a pandemic. That being said, it's between the buyer and the seller. It does help the buyer if they're looking to preserve some of their cash. For example, I have a deal right now. It's a $4.7 million acquisition, so I need a 15% injection. So in this case, the buyers bring in 10% and then the sellers hold in 5% and putting it on full standby, which we would consider injection. That way they don't have to bring that extra 5% cash. They can preserve that capital. Working capital is another hot topic because believe it or not, there are some lenders out there that think working capital is a way of giving back a buyer's equity injection to them. False. First of all, you need to determine an adequate amount of working capital. And you do that by looking at the 12 months of monthly cash flow projections. And if there's going to be a cash flow deficit in those first few months, you're going to want to bridge that gap and provide that amount of working capital. So that money's going to get spent. You're not just giving them back their money. So we're structuring these deals with adequate working capital. And that's super important because lack of adequate working capital is a big reason for early defaults. And you're just shooting yourself in the foot at that point. By the way, as you're structuring and pre-approving, you also want to do a sanity check on the valuation. SBA loans require a third-party valuation, but as you do more and more of these, you start to get a feel for valuations. There are some pretty high-level rules of thumb you can apply to these situations just to make sure that the price is in the ballpark. You know, people say three times seller's discretionary earnings, but if a business is being sold for, let's say, more than four times seller's discretionary earnings, I'm gonna raise my hand and just question the valuation. One of the common issues I see with regards to valuation is that they wanna value the goodwill by applying a multiple to their annual earnings, but then on top of that, they wanna add the value of the equipment and the inventory and other hard assets within the business. But those assets are what's generating the cash flow that is driving the valuation. So they're already kind of included in the valuation. You don't add them on top, unless there's some extra assets in the business that you don't necessarily need, like excess inventory, for example. Then in those cases, there, there may be a case for you to add that on top of the, the total value of the business. You also have to account for things like normalizing the rent, normalizing the manager's salary or the owner's salary. You know, a lot of these sellers own the building and maybe they're not selling the building in the sale. And perhaps their rent payment wasn't market rent. So an appraiser is going to come in here and normalize the rent, which can affect the annual earnings and thereby the valuation. Another hot topic right now is the sellers that have PPP loans. 
SBA has put out guidance on this matter, and basically a PPP loan needs to be forgiven prior to closing, or else you have to apply for forgiveness and then escrow that amount until the forgiveness has happened. So if sellers right now are trying to get a PPP second draw, they might be delaying their closing of the sale of the business because they have to wait for the forgiveness to open up and then apply for forgiveness and then escrow that amount unless they want to just pay it back at closing. Something that doesn't get talked about enough is businesses with inventory. Usually there's an inventory count a day or two before closing and the buyer wants to make sure that there is an appropriate level of inventory in the business. And sometimes there's less inventory than what was agreed to in the purchase contract and sometimes there's more. In fact, it's quite rare that you would have uh, the exact amount of inventory that was agreed to upfront in the purchase contract be the amount that comes in the inventory count. And buyers and sellers can deal with that a whole number of ways, but the easiest way, and I'm assuming that the buyer and seller have agreed on a separate purchase price for the inventory because a lot of them do that and they want to adjust the price based on that inventory count which is right before closing. So the best way to do that is to make sure there's some seller financing in the transaction. Then you simply adjust the seller note right before the closing. So you don't have to go back and change up the SBA loan right as we're trying to close. Okay, so here's the good news. There's no shortage of buyers right now, thanks to the SBA stimulus. And as you know, they're still waiving the fee and they're paying the first uh, three payments up to nine grand a month. And buying a business is a good way to take advantage of that program. It's the sellers we need more of. Sellers with clean books, willing to sell their business for a fair price. As a lender, if you're looking to get further into the world of business acquisitions, it's all about execution right now. Potential buyers and brokers and sellers all value the ability for a lender to execute above all else. So keep that in mind when you're going to market because there's a lot of really skilled assassin level SBA lenders out there in the marketplace specialized in business acquisitions, and I'm one of them. And I do welcome the competition because there's just so much business out there right now. So thank you for tuning in to this week's episode. One programming note, we're going to be doing a lot more interviews going forward. I have two scheduled this week, so look out for that. I want my guests to do more of the talking for one, because I am running out of things to say myself. So have a great week. Come back next week. Thanks for listening.